Welcome to Conversations in Bioethics, a podcast series in which we discuss contemporary bioethics issues with Cleveland State faculty and other professionals. Hi, this is Tony Nicoletti, department member of philosophy and comparative religion here at Cleveland State. This podcast is part two of a larger conversation with Joe DeMarco and Sam LaPuma, in which we discuss their book, The Dying Experience, Expanding Options for Dying and Suffering Patients. In part one, we discuss our overall thesis about expanding options on hastening death and the role of continuous sedation until death, as well as the important role of respect for autonomy in arguments for hastening death. In this episode, we delve more into physician-assisted suicide, their definition of a rational suicide, and application of it to progressive dementia disorder. So you defend the moral acceptability of rational suicide. So can you tell us what is a rational suicide? Uh, And this is granting just a common understanding of suicide. Is a rational suicide always morally permissible? Uh, So, for example, let's take a person who has suffered from bouts of depression and has good reasons to think he will suffer again, although he may also have, you know, some good times, too. And he rationally concludes that suicide is the right action to take. Uh, On your view, would this person be okay? Um, Should, you know, when should we stop a person like this? Should we stop them or would we only stop them if they're, you know, threatening in front of us? And I just wanted to mention as a side note, in an earlier uh, podcast episode, Alison Robichaud discussed a case in Europe in which a woman fit the conditions for, by their, I guess by their standards, for physician-assisted suicide due to suffering from long-term mental illness. Um, so I guess there is some precedent for that, at least in Europe, although that wouldn't be legal here. Yeah, well, good questions. In, in, and and we, it, it is good to separate the issue from what, acts, what actions do we want to count as suicide, mm-hmm. whether we want that sky uh, diver to, to count as a suicide, especially if it's done multiple times. The, but the issue, uh, uh, but we do talk about the rationality of suicide, as you say, given that we've accepted that, an, that such and such an action is a suicide. And um, we base our view on um, uh, Richard Brandt's view. And Richard Brandt was a philosopher. Uh, He's died some years ago now, but he was very influential for my generation. His textbooks on ethics were widely read. Uh, So, and he's basically a utilitarian, and he gives a utilitarian defense of suicide. And economists uh, also give utilitarian defenses of suicide, but there there's kind of more elaborate and more mathematically oriented. Some of those defenses are, are very hard to read unless you know calculus. Um, but the the defense of the rationality of suicide goes like this: if it's predictable that the rest of a person's life will involve more play, pain than pleasure. Now, pain and pleasure are, are words. When we study philosophy, we know it's difficult to define those. But anyway, we want to give just the, the overview here. If there's a, a, a predictable life of more pain than pleasure, then for that person, suicide is rational. Now, there's there's questions about, well, maybe uh, the, the next year will be more pleasure than pain and then the rest of my life will be so that predicted though too yeah and and predictable and that's one good reason so so then if it's predictable that the life of a person involves more pain than pleasure then the suicide becomes rational but something being rational doesn't mean it's morally required Mm -hmm. and it doesn't even mean it's morally permissible it just means it's rational it's a rational act. Uh, if that person has moral obligations that suicide would preclude living up to, for example, caring for a family, then those obligations may say that for you, suicide is unacceptable. So, so you, Okay, so other things being considered, a rational suicide, if you have no other obligations, would be morally permissible. Yes. But it may, but it is then once again becomes one of the factors you have to consider. And so if you have these obligations to children or spouse yeah. or something financial, then it's not morally permissible, although it, the reasons are, ra- or you have good reasons for Well, it. and you pointed so. out, well, this involves a prediction. The, the expectation of the person is that the rest of the person's life will involve more pain than than happiness. Uh, 
But that's hard to figure. <laughs> you know, it's it's for all I know, the rest of my life will involve more pain than well, that. I don't think so. But I... this because some people could say, let's say you accept like a, a self or uh, some type of like you you yes uh, view of happiness in which happiness is human flourishing. Um, people who have a, a life in which they fulfill their potential have a lot of pain, right? Because there's a lot of pain that goes into writing the great novel or and only we know from studies a little bit of pleasure people get past the success really quickly so how that even what do we it's, classify well, as it's it's t- it's it's tough to do well i would address it this way so think about you're projecting your future in terms of utility and um that you can project that there would be not enough utility for you to have a satisfactory exist and a life that's acceptable to you is the way I would put it. And that obviously is a little bit of... Um, One in which would, you can enjoy your pursuit of writing the book to any extent. Or... Right, so suppose that you can't engage in any activity you find fulfilling. Well, well, how about our... The, I brought up the case earlier of the quadriplegic uh, mm-hmm. patient. She is very active. So this was not an acceptable existence for her. So and when she's at, looking at her future and the utility of it, she doesn't find enough utility in the future, positive utility, to override just ending her existence right now. So in, in the, the balance of her scales is death is preferable to what the, right. the limited utility, if, if any, that I could get from continuing. Okay, can I play devil's advocate sure. for a minute or throw something else in here? Um, a case I always find endless ability to think about is Dax Coward. So Dax Coward, what I always find endlessly fascinating about is that he wanted to die, right? He wanted somebody to help him die. He wanted just to refuse treatment when he knew that wasn't possible. He was forced to live, essentially. And yet, if you look at any documentary or read anything about Dax, well, he continued. He just died recently, I guess, in the beginning of this year. He lived a very fulfilling life. And he so if you think about pain it was the point with dax was that it wasn't an acceptable life to live with the de- the physical defects of having been a burn victim but in terms of physical pain and pleasure it seems as though he got something he went on to fight for patient rights and how do you work that into well, it well we we do a, a a detailed excerpt of the dax case and 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 my research, what I think helps our argument is when he would be interviewed. He, he I think said this several times. He's still upset, sure, and f- still feels violated. So I think that proves the point that you know, it it, it he he went on. He pers- so in a classic paternalistic argument, you would say you'll thank me later. Right. He's not thanking anybody. Mm-hmm. He's well, still and, and feeling he says violated. If, if it happened again, he would opt for death. Mm-hmm. I, I think he's very clear on that, even though he, he led after getting over everything a life that, as you say, looked successful and happy. Right. I guess the part of the point I was getting at, though, is that the pain, the, the decision of Dax, or at least the pain of having to have continued to live all those years when he made that decision, it's a different kind of pain than the the pain you talked about physically of somebody who, and maybe mentally, a person in, who's in a deep, depressed state. Yes. You know, yeah. I, I don't know. The idea that... that the, I was just the, curious the, how those all factor into a utilitarian calculation. Yeah, and, and the utilitarian calculation is difficult because you have to project way ahead. So the older you get, the easier it is to project uh, the rest of your life. Uh, well, I'm retired now 12 years. Uh, it's still, for me, projecting ahead the rest of my life is difficult. I don't know what's coming. I, uh, I'm i hoping for very good things. But it's... but. One of the reasons to have a time limit in physician-assisted suicide laws, Oregon says the person, it has to be predictable, I think by two physicians, that the person will die within six months. Mm -hmm. Well, the closer the death is, the more the, the value of that life in terms of happiness and pain becomes predictable. So I think that's one of the reasons it's almost implicit in the law, this de- definition of rational suicide, because the, the, law, the, 
the the philosophical or economic definition of rational suicide involves a prediction which is very hard to do over long periods of time and now the law says it must be six months until your death so the the law is sort of recognizing that you're in a state where now you know what the rest of your life is going to be right, right or like and so you can make a more rational decision what about that case that I mentioned in Europe? Would you both, or I, I guess it's we don't have all the facts here, but if somebody had suffered from mental disorder over an, a sufficient amount of life into adulthood, and just, uh, I guess at the end, she really just felt that she was nev- this was just going to be a cycle of her life, and it was these long bouts of depression, would that be a rational suicide in that case? Yeah, I think um, in these cases, uh, they're some of the most difficult ones, Mm -hmm. Um, but one of the things that we tried to come to terms with is that there's a reasonableness to how long we should expect someone to battle something or put up with something. Right. If, if you're in your 20s and you're depressed, we would hope that maybe we can help you. You have a long life ahead of you, potentially. Maybe we could give you good symptom relief. You'll mm-hmm. find good quality. If you're in your 60s and you've been dealing with harrowing depression for 40 years, and, you know, I would be more sympathetic with the notion that, you know, you've been through enough and, and I would leave it more up to the person, especially it's tricky with depression and competence. I mean, are they competent? Mm-hmm. Um, we can't even let an incompetent person make a decision. So I'm, I'm assuming the person is depressed yet competent. They've dealt with the condition for a, 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 a significantly long time and I certainly find reasonableness to that kind of request. Right. And, and then that, you that, think that should be between them and their physician. And that's why it's right. a good idea to have a definition of, of rational suicide because we can now answer that question in relation to that. So we look at the 20 year old and, the, and I think you said 60 year old and we see a big difference in terms of predictability and therefore we, we feel that Suicide in one case is more acceptable than the other case. Right. You have better basis for a prediction of further a, right. a lifetime of this, which you don't have in your 20s, but you have that in. And, and if you were in your 20s but had a more predictable situation, it might be more right. reasonable. Right. Okay. Um, let, well, let's actually apply it to a case that um, I would say is probably one of the most controversial arguments, uh, maybe, I don't know, arguably so, in your book, which is to apply this idea to progressive dementia disorder. Uh, According to your view, those suffering from progressive dementia disorder or PDD should be given access to physician-assisted suicide even when biological death isn't likely within the requirements that it now is, which is about six months. Um, So can you discuss your argument and maybe use the if you recall offhand, the case of Sandy Bem that you discuss versus Alice, who the movie, I think that was the movie, there was a movie about her, to illustrate why you think people with PDD should have access to it. Because in the case of Alice, there was a failure there, I think. And in the case of Sandy Bem, I think that was a... Sandy Bem, I think this goes back to your point about a fulfilling life. Uh, Sandy, uh, Sandra Bem was a psychologist, I, I believe, at... Uh, uh, I think Cornell. Cornell University, I think that's right. And uh, she was facing dementia and didn't want to live a life of a demented person. And so she designed her own suicide. She got drugs, probably illegally, I don't know, from, um, from Mexico. She got help from her divorced husband, uh, who she had a good relationship with, and at a certain point, she knew that she was sinking deeper and deeper into dementia. She knew she couldn't live that kind of fulfilling life she had before, the life of a psychologist. She couldn't do that anymore. And so with the help of her ex-husband, she drank the medications. But she was so far gone that uh, she couldn't tell uh, which was the medication and which was the drink that would help to, I think it was some kind of a soft drink or something that she used with, a wine. It was red wine. And what the, the, and the drug was clear, almost like water. And she couldn't tell the difference 
that's that's how mm-hmm. demented she was between the two and she also couldn't remember the instructions so she said to her ex-husband uh, can I take little sips and he said no if you take little sips you'll just fall asleep so she said oh well she had been told that she knew that but this is this is the state she was in she was still I think people knowing the the account and there was a New York uh, Times magazine article about it, which is readily available online. Sandra Bem uh, uh, looked that up, and I think reading the account, somebody could come to the conclusion that at that point she was engaging in a rational suicide, and that she was doing it uh, competently. She did not lose her autonomy, although. So you would say at that point she still had not been at the point where she lost her autonomy, and it wouldn't have been justified right. for the husband to help her. That's right. Okay. Now, whether it was legal for him to help her, I don't know. But no, I, I meant morally. Actually, morally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nothing about the BEM case is legal in a sense. She got sure. her drugs on the internet yeah. and uh, from Mexico, I think, um, and she was not able to get any prescription here. In fact, I think even with our suicide laws, if even if she was in Oregon, she wouldn't qualify. Um, so I think this speaks to the difficulty, and th- what we, we were trying to argue for is to try to find some kind of sweet spot. It's mm-hmm. somewhat difficult, but we don't think it's impossible, where you've lived up to a certain point where your quality is good, you're mentally competent, but the end of your competence is somewhat imminent, and the ethics of the situation changes dramatically when you're not competent anymore. Then you can't make any decisions, whether we want you to or not. And so we felt that to stand on the most solid moral ground uh, it, with our thesis of respect for autonomy and informed consent, that if you could commit suicide before you become demented or to, incompetent to make decisions for yourself, but still lived a, a good amount of quality up to that point, that that would be the optimal situation. Uh, again, I put use the expression standing on firm moral ground because if we wait longer than that, then we have to make substituted judgment. And, and we feel that would be too difficult. We'd actually be killing an incompetent person. And the the, the sure. ethics of that are very precarious. Whereas if you still ha- are competent and doing things for yourself, we can feel better about the moral dynamics of it. Do you think this decision can be made by that individual who... They, I know they talk in the literature about the difference between competence and decision-making capacity, which can actually fluctuate in the morning and the evening for... depending. De- you know, for a somebody who, depending on what their illness is, and that competence can also be like a legal judgment, right? So once somebody's declared incompetent, until they're declared competent, they wouldn't you they are now incompetent. But a person could be competent and yet, but yet at times not have decisional making capacity. Well, I think these are settled by law, aren't they, Joe? I mean, where well, you, 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 for instance, you could have. What if you have an estate? Um, and and we want to know if you still have the right to change your will because right. you know obviously Absolutely. the opening statement I'm sound mind and body so I think these can be settled legally. Yeah, but typically we don't go for that. I mean, we don't go to a legal decision. Competence is a legal term, mm-hmm. and once a person's declared competent or incompetent, that that has duration to it. So if somebody's declared incompetent, pretty much they're incompetent right. the rest of their lives. There may be reason to revisit the judgment, but capacity, if, if a person is in a, 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 an auto crash and, and goes into a coma, the p- person obviously doesn't, doesn't have, have capacity sure. to do anything. Thing. But there's a lot of situations medically where certain diseases cause conditions which blur thought and make it so that the person is incoherent and the like and therefore loses temporarily capacity. Right. So capacity comes and goes. But with demented people, uh, in Bem's case, she made her intentions known for a long time. That's what I wanted to ask you is would you require that that person had had discussions or some some statement about this for PD, if you're going to av- allow them to avail themselves of physician-assisted yeah. suicide when they have PDD, That's right. w- you would want there to have been prior discussions prior to even that window. Yes. Or, or could they make that decision? Yeah. You it, know. It, it, and it just 
the fact that this has been said for a long time validates the case that this is their considered judgment. Now, with, with uh, Sandra Bem, she couldn't tell the difference between wine and a clear fluid, right. red wine and a clear fluid. So that gives us reason to say, well, how competent is she? But the fact that she's been saying this all along, mm -hmm. and at that point she was asking for it, leads us to, to the conclusion, which I think is fairly clear, and I think any court looking at it would come to the same, almost any court, yeah. we know there's different courts, but would come to the same decision that she was competent. Now, there's a case in, in uh, the Netherlands. The Netherlands are great because they really investigate and, and they look at every case of assisted suicide, and they evaluate it based on their law, which is a very complex law with many facets to it. And there was, they accept advanced directives. So you could, you oh. could. Uh, if you're incompetent the, now, but you had it in your hand, I was going to ask about that. They do, but there's one case where the advanced directive was very old. Mm. And we know that people change their minds. We, to try, here's a, here's a very significant action, physician assisted suicide. And in, in uh, the Netherlands, for a person like that, it would have been an act of euthanasia. The physician would have in, injected the person or whatever they would do to actually kill the person and not just give them the, the medication to use themselves. So in that case, we I'm suspicious in a case like that, that that was a bit too much, that that advanced directive was too long ago to, to uh, justify this very dramatic event. Mm -hmm. Well, also, what we're concerned about, uh, the slippery slope arguments, and in terms of our research, the, the probably the, the most serious and important secular argument against our work is a slippery slope. And that's why we try to hang our hat on respect for autonomy uh, and informed consent because then we can draw a hard line in the sand. Mm -hmm. and if you start killing incompetent people based on a past request, we would think that the proponents of slippery slope arguments would just have all the more fodder and, and we're not mm -hmm. as comfortable defending that. Right, so about Sandra Bem, you would say she was still within that yourself? I mean, I say. think Joe's right. It's it's a little shaky, she got yeah. close, but I, I would I would defend it. And, and I think I like Joe's point of, she kept saying this over and over again. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think if she said it last week and then couldn't tell the difference between red wine, clear it, it just makes it more difficult for us. Right. But if you say something over a long period of time, we have more confidence that we are following your wishes. Okay, so that's a good point, too. In her case, if she'd only said it a week before, and now here she was at this point where she couldn't, but it, it is the continued request of it. Um, I think Joe used that. Consider judgment, I consider, thought was a yeah, good way yeah, to put it. Yeah, and I, I think this the Sandra Bem case brings out another issue that I think is very, very important. And I think it's an issue of fairness an issue of discrimination. Sandra Bem, if, if Sandra Bem qualified at that point for physician-assisted suicide, it would not have worked because she would have had to administer it herself. The, if you read carefully the case of Sandra Bem, she was not able to administer it herself. She was confused. She would have taken little sips and f fell asleep. She couldn't do mm -hmm. it. In the novel Still Alice and the movie version of it, Still Alice did not want to burden her relatives with this. Sandra Bem had this trust in her ex-husband. They were both university teachers, and he willingly, apparently willingly, helped her. But uh, Still Alice was not willing to burden her family, so she developed an elaborate scheme to so that she would know when it was appropriate to do it and just how she would do it. But unfortunately, in the novel, and it's, it's in, in Sandra Bem's case, it almost mirrors that. If Sandra, if Sandra Bem didn't have her ex-husband with her, it would have almost precisely mirrored Still Alice, uh, even with all the planning, the drugs from Mexico, etc. Still Alice could not do it, was unable to do it, and, and had to live the rest of her life in a way that she did not want. Right, but in the still Alice, the way you're, at least the way you're presenting it, the the thing there was because she herself didn't want to involve her family. So she, there, it, even if it were legal, she might still, yes. unless she were just going to confide in a physician and have a, you, I, I guess, but, is but, that but what in, you're in saying? But in the Netherlands, you, it wouldn't be the family that helps. Yeah. It's a physician. It, okay, and, right. and there are willing physicians. Now, so that's There's your, a lot of unwilling physicians right. to do that, but there are willing physicians to do it. Right. Uh, we've had cases in the past where 
where physicians did it in ways that were quite illegal without the consent of patients. Right. Uh, so there are physicians that are willing to do this, and we don't need a physician necessarily to do it if we if we wrote the law in a certain way. Um, so it's not the so if Alice had physician assisted suicide available and physician-assisted suicide was like it is in the Netherlands, she would not have had to burden her family. Right, right. Um, and she could have had a, a plan, and it, could have, it yeah. could have taken place, and it wouldn't have become as tragic. There's an account I want to make here that Sam knows about uh, 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 of, of a woman, and I forget her name. I think you remember her name, who's the, an advocate for physician-assisted suicide in Ohio. Um, yeah, you, I could find it. All right. Um, she grew up in Oregon, or at least lived a good bit of her life in Oregon. And her husband, I believe, was a physician. And um, he was diagnosed with dementia. And living in Oregon, he knew that if he had a disease like cancer and a six-month projection for death, until death, he could have had physician-assisted suicide. But he was unhappy because dementia wasn't covered by the law. Ironically, he was subsequently diagnosed with cancer and became happy about it. Right. And he said, now I can do it. The irony about a law that subjects this person to the rest of their life, living a life they didn't want, but if they had cancer or a, a variety of other diseases, but cancer is one of the main ones, then um, then he could have physician-assisted suicide. Yeah, her name is Peg Sandeen, S-A-N-D-E-E-N, and it's um, deathwithdignity.org. Right, right. Yeah, we. Uh, I think were you at her yeah, lecture we went too? To we a, both had her lecture. Club. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a dramatic account and. Her father's experience, I think he was her stepfather, I'm not sure about that. Her father's experience led her to this this mission of bringing physician-assisted suicide to Ohio. Very dramatic story. And also arguing for yes. uh, it in cases of something like progressive dementia I disorder? I don't or, no? think she does. Okay. I, she's a very political person. I don't mean that in a bad sense. Right. But she wants a law passed. Sure. And she's willing to have the law look like Oregon's law. Sure. But we asked her about extending it to uh, f uh, uh, dementia, and... Uh, She's not willing to go there. Not committed there. Well, I'd like I mean, to talk a little bit. Well, I didn't interrupt. Um, and, you know, whatever she's thinking, she wouldn't say one way or the other because I think because she's a wants this politically and she knows that to extend it would make it sure. harder to pass that law. When you look at an Oregon law, and Joe, you're talking about needing assistance. You know, I think uh, Timothy Quill really outlined a lot of this, and what he did was was. Uh, significant, important, and, and kind of pragmatic. Um, the first thing he did was distance all healthcare practitioners. So the only thing that the physician does is provide a prescription and the pharmacist fills it. And no other healthcare practitioners ever go near the patient. They, they, you can have some kind of advocate, but no one is ever to help you with it. So I think all of this is very sound to prevent slippery slope concerns. I mean, when we look at, analyze it as philosophers, it's easy to say, well, my throat closed up uh, the day before I was going to take it. You know, can't you just help me? And it seems perfectly reasonable, but we understand that social policy has to move slowly, and we're willing to move slowly, but we would still want to have the transparency of arguments. And as for us, if you're following the will of the competent patient, you're on safe ground. Whether somebody killed you upon request or whether you took the medication yourself, I don't. we don't find that that significant, but for social policy, perhaps But for perhaps social and legal policy and well, trying to get something passed. Sure. And even going back to the continuous sedation until death, if it was a viable option earlier, that is even at least better or helpful in a way that well, currently... Well, people even, there's another angle people can take called um, voluntarily stopping eating and drinking. So V -S -E -D. I thought that was very interesting that you talked about that in your book. I, I really haven't had a chance to bring it up, but I do think that is because that is something... I, I think there was that case, Elizabeth Bouvi, Bouvia. Yeah, Bouvier. And mm -hmm. I, un, to be honest, a lot of times, even when I read it in or see it in a textbook or something, I kind of bypass it 
But it really is interesting, and you bring it up. Do you want to say just a little bit about it? Um, well, sure. First of all, I found um, I have a somewhat cynical attitude about this because it seems like people are at the end of their rope. You know, they want to die. They want to hasten their death. They have no options. And so they say, well, what else can I do? I won't eat and drink. Uh, we even had a case where this caused a lot of hand-wringing over healthcare practitioners in a nursing home and we found it odd that they had to have an ethics consult and they had to huddle together to finally say well we'll support this woman i mean in our view uh, you can't force people to eat and drink we, we, for elizabeth bouvier was force fed we, we found that to be i think um the expression we used was an egregious violation of her bodily integrity right and so um we look at VSED as just um, an act of desperation, in a sense, for patients because there are no other options. Right. You're not really arguing that it should be institutionalized as a practice or something that is brought up. But insofar as somebody themselves wants to do it, they what what should a hospital worker do? I, I mean, we would feel that, that uh, well, again, think about it this way. The, any decision to hasten your death should be examined, right? So if, if your decision doesn't seem sound for one reason or another, we can't support it. But if the decision is sound, then the manner in which you do it would seem to be, uh, should be supported. So, so if you're going to stop eating and drinking, you're going to suffer from some symptoms of that. And we would like healthcare practitioners to help alleviate you of those uncomfortable symptoms. Okay. In the book, we have a case where a, a woman, I believe it was a woman, w was in hospice care and wanted to stop eating and drinking. Now, that's easier said than done, and there are certain uh, uh, unfortunate side effects to that that are treatable. So when somebody stops eating and drinking, health care can... can uh, help to make that a more comfortable experience. So this person wanted from the hospice workers uh, permission to do voluntary uh, stopping of eating and drinking and uh, uh, wanted their aid to make it more comfortable. Well, hospice is not in the business of hastening death. And this is another case that shows that. And the, the, the uh, healthcare people in hospice had tremendous difficulty. They had to have a couple of meetings about it. They went to other hospice people to uh, get advice about it. And finally, they figured out, well, we can support it. We can give this person comfort care while they're going through the, the uh, process of dying. Uh, so it, it's a, another case that shows the, the the limitations. You would think that that's something once they heard that, that they would, again, as Sam says, once it's a supportable decision, that they'd be there to say, well, we'll make it comfortable for you. That's their job, to mm -hmm. make things comfortable. They know this person's going to die soon, but they had trouble agreeing to it and finally did. Now, that doesn't mean in the next case they won't. Right. Just to type a loose sense, so you would classify Sam, I should say, would you classify the case of Alice at that point isn't really physician, if, if there was some help so that she didn't have to use her family, she would have really required voluntary active euthanasia. Is that? Um, yeah, but I don't know if I could call it voluntary. That right. would be the problem, sure. right? Okay. It, it, if, if Alice is still deemed competent and able to make decisions on her own behalf and she needed help, I think we could defend that. Um, if she's not competent, then obviously we can't do anything for her other right. than try to keep her comfortable and happy. Right. And but then at the point at which a health a healthcare professional has to step in to assist assist you, it's not really uh, to do something more than give you the medication. You referenced Timothy Quill and, and, and how it was. Oh yeah, you would need help. You would yeah. need it. And so I and think it is euthanasia. I would it's I would think so. Yes. Okay. Okay. And, and it should be voluntary, obviously. Okay. But that's where the discrimination comes in. We, we talked about people with dementia like uh, Sandra Bem, but there are other people who have muscular problems that can't right. feed themselves. So they, they, they are not, even if they meet all the requirements for physician-assisted suicide in Oregon, it can't happen because they would need some kind of assistance in, right. in taking the medications. Right. I think discrimination is a good way to put it. It would be a, a discriminatory act against them. Right. Okay. Uh, just, I think you brought up a little while ago, uh, Joe, but you had mentioned physician responsibility, and you would not require under within certain 
limitations, you would not require any physician to engage in these practices. So what are physician responsibilities in this context? What would you envision them to be? In? Well, it's, it's one of these Either cases where conscientious it. objection is, is, you know, right on the front of the thing. Mm -hmm. people, uh, people today, for example, the Ohio law, as we read, permits giving drugs that, that are likely to lead to a person's death almost immediately or within hours. Uh, there are people that will not give those drugs. So if a nurse is ordered to administer that drug, the nurse can say, no, I know or I believe that this will lead to this person's death very quickly. And we would call that conscientious objection, and we, we would respect that. Are there limits to conscientious well, objection? Well, there are, there are always limits, and the, the Nurses Association uh, and their code of ethics says that there, there needs to be options. Okay. So that if there are no options, then you're required to do these things, even though you object to them. Now, I don't know how the federal law reads on that, and that might, that might uh, not involve options, I, I just don't uh, recall. But for, for nurses, the, the Nurses Association, in effect, gives that responsibility, but allows it to be traded off to somebody else. And there are typically people willing to do that. When I watched this man uh, die, well, actually have the ventilator removed, uh, the nurses were aggressively willing to do it. They thought it was in the best interest of that person. Now, some other, the bioethicist who was there, said to the nurse, are you willing to do this? And the nurse said, yes. And he became a little more aggressive, but maybe right or wrong. And he said, are you sure you're willing to do this? And she looked at him and she said, I am absolutely sure. Now, there are people who, when they believe that this is good for the patient, will do it. Other people believe maybe because of their view of the sanctity of life or their religious requirements or whatever they believe that won't do it. And we should have options for those people. And typically we do. Sure. We would just typically stipulate that a conscientious objection can't be used when you are the only professional available because your professional obligations would override your personal moral conscientious objections. Right. And all that really means, you can't force the person to do it. All that means is they could be punished or sanctioned afterwards, maybe lose their job or their license. Right. Well, I think we've pretty fully covered uh, some of the issues. Is there do you feel like we've covered everything or is there anything that well just to close i'd like to thank you for the opportunity to oh, come absolutely. and talk and uh, i just wanted to emphasize our basic thesis is to expand options and we certainly see the momentum um i, I would say uh that it will be legal in every state in the not too distant future maybe a physician assisted suicide i'm not so sure about euthanasia but um, there's momentum building, and um, we're hoping to keep uh, the momentum going. Good. Well, thank you very much. Tom. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. This has been um, absolutely enjoyable, uh, and I truly appreciate both of you coming. Um, and I just want to say, uh, again, the book that we are talking about is The Dying Experience, Expanding Options for Dying and Suffering Patients. Uh, the publication is this year, 2019, by Roman and Littlefield, and the authors, of course, Sam LaPuma and Joe DeMarco. Um, it's very accessible reading, goes through the history of the issue, and really talks about the moral and legal issues, um, and I think works on a variety of levels for a professor or an instructor who wants to cover it in the classroom and a layperson who wants to read about the issue. So um, I really enjoyed it, and uh, good luck with it. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to Conversations in Bioethics, a podcast brought to you by the Cleveland State Department of Philosophy and Comparative Religion. Produced by faculty member Dr. Tony Nicoletti in conjunction with the Center for Instructional Technology and Distance Learning. For more information about the Department of Philosophy and Comparative Religion course offerings, please visit our website at csuohio.edu or call 216-687-3900.